Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text is taken from our Old Testament lesson, Isaiah chapter 61, as read a few moments ago, dear fellow redeemed in Christ. This morning I'd like to begin with a little quiz. I know my confirmands don't believe that because I never give little quizzes or little tests in confirmation, but this really is a little quiz. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. Now the question, of whom are these words spoken? Well, given the fact that these words occur in the 61st chapter of Isaiah, I suppose that the prophet Isaiah would be a safe guess. It is written in first person, is it not? But if you were to open your Bibles to Luke chapter 4, you'd find another person speaking these words. When Jesus returned to Nazareth, the town where he had been brought up, he was asked to read the scriptures in the synagogue service. As he enrolled the scroll and read these verses from Isaiah 61, he announced, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. The words that we have before us from the prophet Isaiah were written by Isaiah more than seven centuries before the birth of Jesus. Yet according to Jesus, these words remain unfulfilled until Jesus came. Centuries before his incarnation, this Jesus spoke through the prophet Isaiah. And he said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. Jesus is using vivid language to describe his mission. He came to bring good news to the poor, He came to bind up the brokenhearted. He came to proclaim freedom to the captives and the prisoners. You see, the nation of Israel in Isaiah's time knew what it was like to be poor and brokenhearted and captive and in prison. While most of them would not experience the great Babylonian captivity, they still experienced difficult times. Some of them, as the psalm says, sat and wept as they remembered Zion, the city of God, the place where the temple of the Lord now lay in ruins. But Isaiah has good news to preach to them. He has good news to proclaim to them. The Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prisons of those who are bound. Their day of exile was about to end. Freedom, liberty, this was their future. I suppose that all of this can be a little bit unrelatable to people who have never known anything but liberty. Here in America, we might argue about whether we're one nation under God, but very few of us attempt to argue the concept of liberty and justice for all. Why, this is the land that Patrick Henry once cried, give me liberty or give me death. And I think it's the citizens of New Hampshire that still have on their license plates, live free or die. This, the United States of America, is the land of the free and the home of the brave. And sometimes I wonder if all this talk in the Bible about liberty resonates with people like us who have never known anything else. 
However, as Jesus points out in Luke chapter 4, the liberty, the freedom that he is referring to is a different kind of freedom. Yeah, we experience a lot of freedom. We can do what we want, right? After church, we can go out for breakfast or brunch to any place that we want to go. We have that freedom. But what Jesus is talking about here is a spiritual freedom, one that the Declaration of Independence can't declare. It's a freedom that only God can give. Everyone who sins is a slave to sin, Jesus said. So whether we realize it or not, the Bible says, according to our sinful nature, we are all captives. We are all prisoners. We are all slaves. The Apostle Paul emphasizes this fact. In his letter to the Romans, he says, When I want to do good, evil is right there with me. Paul says, And I see another law at work in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of sin at work within my members. How many of us have ever felt that way? You want to make good choices. You want to do the right thing. But for some reason, you end up making the bad choice. If you can relate, then you know the sinful nature at work within us. This is how Martin Luther put it in one of his hymns. He said, fast bound in Satan's chains I lay, death brooded darkly o'er me. Sin was my torment night and day, in sin my mother bore me. But daily deeper still I fell, my life became a living hell. So firmly sin possessed me. How many of you are a fan of those home improvement shows you see on TV? Fixer Upper is a favorite in my house. Many times, Chip and Joanna Gaines will take a house that in all likelihood should be condemned, and they turn it, miraculously, they turn it into a home that could be featured in a DIY magazine. As I read these words from Isaiah chapter 61, I can't help but think that Jesus is behind the greatest makeover this world has ever known. Think about it for a moment. Think about the before picture. Poor, broken-hearted, prisoners, mourning in the depths of despair. And then Jesus comes. He comes proclaiming the kingdom of God. He comes proclaiming the good news of salvation. And the poor are made rich. The broken-hearted are lifted up. The prisoners and the captives are set free. Perhaps you recognize that description all too well. If you don't, you should. You see, this description is you. It's me. We were poor, but Christ has made us rich by giving us something that no amount of money could ever purchase. Eternal life in heaven. We were brokenhearted in sorrow over sin, but Christ has lifted us up, living and dying in our place as our substitute. We were the prisoners and the captives, slaves to sin, death, and the devil. But Christ has set us free. He has redeemed us, liberating us through his death and resurrection. You may have noticed that this morning is the third Sunday in Advent. And you may have noticed on our Advent wreath that we, we lit one special candle. It's the pink candle. This candle symbolizes the joy that we have in the coming of Christ. And joy is a big part of the message of this third Sunday in Advent. 
The joy we have comes from not all the good things we do or all of the good things that have been done to us. Certainly we do get joy from these things. But real joy, true joy, lasting joy comes from knowing our Savior Jesus Christ. That's what Isaiah is saying here in our text. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exalt in my God. The Lord is the source of our joy, for he has clothed us with garments of salvation. He has covered us with the robe of righteousness. Even in the worst of circumstances, even when we make those bad choices, even when we do the wrong thing, even when we still feel the effects of sin in our lives, we can live with joy. Because you who were once poor are made rich through the blood of Jesus. You who were once brokenhearted have been lifted up through the blood of Jesus. You who were once prisoners and captives, slaves to sin, death, and the devil, are now set free through the blood of of Jesus. Christ's blood has been put on you, and he has put you on the path that leads to eternal life. And that, my friends, is all the reason in the world to be joyful this day and tomorrow and forever. I pray that the Lord will bless you and bring you such lasting joy this Christmas season and always. Amen. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Our service continues now as we with one voice make confession of our Christian faith through the words of the Nicene Creed found on the back cover of your bulletin. Please stand.